Last week, I preached on the blood of Jesus. Was it last week or week before last? I've forgotten now. Week before last, but now I'm going to bring a sermon tonight. It says how he died seven ways for us. Some of you are looking at me. We've got to understand what the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is to the church. You've got to understand what Christ actually did on his way to Calvary for the church. Because, see, there's so many churches. I've got a, something. Get me out of the monitors. I've got, there's, there's so many churches now don't want to talk about the cross of Calvary. They don't want to talk about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, there's a lot of them don't even want to talk about the word of God no more. They want to have good little stories to motivate you, make you feel good, and go home. I posted something this, that today I hope some of you take time to read. It's right lengthy, but it talks about entertainers and leaders. We as leaders can no longer afford to walk being scared to offend somebody. We, matter of fact, as leaders, we should be challenging you every time you walk through these doors to hold you accountable to a life better than what we lived yesterday. Are you listening to me? Because what happens, the church has gotten so comfortable so safe where they're at. But what happened? Them flames have been going out. We, we, we no longer have the power that we used to hear the preachers talk about. We no longer have the, that unction in us to go forth that we don't want to be offensive. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Just the name that we go by has offended a lot of people. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and I, get, I get so tickled. They say, y'all trash. No, not really. We are totally redeemed, anointed servants of the Most High. And I said, that's what we are. And I said, but what we really are, we're the children of God. What we really are, we're the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. What we really are is the children of God been purchased with the price that we don't even belong to ourselves no more. Amen. That's who we are. And, but you've got to understand some things about the blood. But I want to talk to you about these seven different ways and what each way meant to you and what means to us still yet today. But before I get to preaching this, I want to make one other thing to you. As we go forth, we're not here to entertain. We're not here. It's just like, you know, sis got a little flustered a little bit of that song. We're not professionals. We're, we're, not, we don't do, we're not a cover band. We're recycled. But I'm going to explain something to you. What's wrong with the church? We, I, and I believe in being the best we can. I really do. But I'm going to tell you this. The professionals built the Titanic. An amateur built an ark. Are you listening to me? The professional said the Titanic wouldn't go down. Everybody told him, Noah, that thing ain't going to float. And we don't even know what you're talking about, rain coming. Or have you lost your freaking mind? Hey, you know what? Let me tell you something. But that right now, it's getting ready to see things coming up on the earth like they've never dreamed before. Bible prophecy is coming true up for our eyes every single day. But you know what? So many Christians that call me up, they're fearful, they're afraid, they're this and that. They said, don't it bother you? I said, well, as a U.S. Marine, I really, it, it, it just galls me the, the path my country's on. It really does. But as a child of God, knowing what the Bible says, and knowing that America plays no part in Bible prophecy, I hate to bust your bubble, because I know a lot of people spend way too much time putting her there. You know what? But when you get your eyes over the water and look across the pond and look at Jerusalem, amen. You know, Israel is one thing, but Jerusalem is the key to Bible prophecy of what's getting ready to happen. And you know, God said when the nation would be born today, where it was born today in 1948. But he said once they would come a nation, when they would come home, they would never be scattered again. I don't care what our government tells them. I don't care what they say to them. Because you know what? I'm going to stand with my Jewish brothers. And that may offend you, but I'm going to stand with them. Because you know what? They are God's chosen apple. That replacement theology some of you believe in, you better get off of it. We didn't replace them. We got put into the program, but they are still the apple of God's eye. Amen. Amen. Now let me get to preaching. i got to read some notes again tonight. I believe it ain't that I don't study enough. I'm getting older. I don't retain enough. I'm telling you. But the title of this is Jesus Shed His Blood Seven Ways. And if you'll go with me to Luke chapter 2 and verse 21. Luke chapter 2, 21. We're going to look at several different verses as we go through this. 
I'm going to go on. Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And I'm reading from the NLT tonight. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angels even before he was conceived. Now, people say, what's the circumcision has to do with anything? Well, let me, let me put it to you what it meant here. Number one, circumcision is to cut away. Cut away the old. And if you understand when Jesus showed up, even as a baby, he was sent here for a purpose. He wasn't a second plan. He was the original plan. He was sent here for a purpose. And this circumcision, the first way he bled and died is when they circumcised him. But check this out. Check this out. When he was circumcised, he was circumcised to bring a new covenant. Oh, listen to this. Get your attention now. See, so many people still want to live under the law. I don't want to live under the law because you break any part of that law, you broke all of it. I like being under this grace and this mercy thing because you know what? I don't know about the rest of you. Y'all might be a whole lot closer than what I am, but I live in Mike Price, and I find myself in the way of God wanting to do in my life all the time. Amen? I don't have to call for the devil to mess me up. Some of you are caught up here with me because I'm going to point fingers in a minute. I mean, because we are our own worst enemies. We are. We are. Because I'm going to tell you why. We're not doing what God's called us to. It's going to hurt a little bit, but it's going to get good, so don't get mad at me. But I don't care if you do tonight. I'm, I'm pumped up, so go ahead. But anyway, but the bottom line is when you, as a child of God, begin to do what God's called you to do, you're going to be busy. You won't be on Facebook bad-mouthing this and then that one. Mm. God, judgment's going to be easy for God. Facebook, poof. <laughs> Everybody's going to be like that politicians. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But the new covenant was coming in. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Well, I guess, yeah, like Luke chapter 22 and verse 39. Starting at verse 39, I'm going to read down through verse 44. All right, here we go. Then accompanied by his disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you would not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down. Oh, golly. Glasses and tape and everything else. Hang on here. And prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him, and he prayed more fervently and was such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Can you imagine praying so hard and being under such pressure that your sweat turns into blood? All of this is leading up from the time he was born. He was sent here to be crucified. He knew that. But then when he prayed, his sweat turned to, to the great drops of blood. And I want you to understand this because what this whole sermon is, let me lay it out a bit to say this beforehand. Every seven steps is a seven steps of deliverance for your walk. And this one I'm getting ready to hit right now, some of you need to listen to me. Because this is brought on by mental pressure and agony. Are you listening to me? He had the weight of the world upon his shoulders. He knew for what purpose he was in that garden praying. And he knew what he was about to, what's getting ready to happen to him. But he's praying for all of us at this point in time. And because of those that he was so heavy, and the mental anguish that when he died, that when he, we suffered that way in the garden, then here's what happened. Because of that mental pressure, he took all that so you and I can have a sound mind. The Bible teaches us a double-minded man or person is unstable in all their ways. The Bible teaches let your yea be yeas and your nay be nay. You shouldn't be standing confused being a child of God. It should be yes, Lord, and no, Lord. It shouldn't be, well, maybe, Lord, I don't know, Lord. I'm still dabbling this, dabbling that. When you get saved, what you say, I'm confessing my sins, but the other part of what you're saying, I'm all in. Are you listening to me? 
God is not looking for weekend kind of lovers. He's not looking for part-time Christians. He's not looking for people just want to go because I had no place to go. He's looking for people that's in love with him, that's got a made-up mind, that is sold out to do the will of God regardless who stands with him, regardless who turns their back on him. Because I said a few months back that God's got a hold of me. I was an evangelist for a lot of years, and been an evangelist, you know, you don't deal with people. You preach, and you can just raise hell in the church and head on down the road, and you're good to go. Amen. But being a pastor, I got to look at you every day, but I can't sell out my convictions to keep you liking me. Are you listening to me? Because we're talking about eternity here. We're talking about living right for Jesus Christ. We're talking about being a light in a dark place for the world to look and say, hey, there's something about that freak show down there. They washed in the blood of the Lamb. They walk different. They talk different. They're living different. They're acting different. They're talking a message that I like to hear about how Jesus can forgive our sins and make us whole again. Amen. Number three, real quick. Matthew 27 and verse 28. Matthew 27. I guess I need to turn that, don't I? Lord of mercy. That's all right. Here we go. Matthew 27, 28. Hold my hand up here. Give me a second. Give me a second. Matthew 27 and verse 28. I done lost my piece of paper. Hang on, don't, don't despair on me yet. Verse 28. They stripped him and, and put a scarlet robe on him. Now you say, preacher, what's it got to do? This is the third way that he bled and died. Because check this out. That that those by him having those stripes upon his back. It's for our healing. Can I get an amen? But when they put that robe back up on him, and then they peeled it off of him again. Now, you, the Bible teaches that Jesus was beaten unrecognizable. You know, as good as the movie The Passion of the Christ was, it didn't do justice how bad he was beaten. I mean, he was beaten unrecognizable. And the, uh, the scholars say that the studying the history of it, most human beings didn't survive the beating that he took. But he took the beating. Why? Because everything that he's done up to getting to Calvary, he's done it for you and I. Because, see, I don't believe that some of you are going to think I'm crazy if I'm going out here on a limb. Y'all back me up, boys. I don't believe people when they die, everybody was meant to die when he died. God was looking for somebody to have a little faith. God was looking for somebody to lay hands on somebody. God was looking for someone to speak life into them flesh, into that bones. Because he said, did you lay hands on the sick? And they shall recover. He said that we pray. What if we ask in his name? That he will do it. I know most of you can do the name and claim it thing for a big automobile. That ain't what he was talking about. But he's talking ministerially here. That what if you ask for, God will do it. Because everything is led up to this end time generation. That they're going to know us by, by our faith. They're going to know us by our fruits. They're going to know us by our works. Amen. They should see us. Go ahead, give God some praise. Don't pat him a cake. I got to get through this song and preach because I can't stand being stopped like this. But listen to this, that we might be healed because I think many times I've seen a lot of miracles. We was in revival many years ago and a grandma come up to me and we was in don't get mad. I'm not picking on no denomination. I just use it where I'm at at the time. I was, I was in a Pentecostal church. And they, we was praying for the sick and stuff, praying for people. People got saved and God was moving. And this grandma come up with a picture of her grandbaby. She said, Brother Mike, will you pray over my grandbaby? It's underway. This little eyes won't open. And it's got a hole in its heart. Would you pray for this? And the strangest thing happened. I felt impressed to say no. I said, no, not right now. She sat on the front pew and began to cry. Well, the devil got in my ear. Boy, you missed it now, big time evangelist. 
you blew it this time, and boy, I'm listening to all this stuff. Maybe, maybe I did. Maybe I did. No, 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 because the Bible teaches my sheep know my voice, and the strangers, they will not follow. Are you listen to me. You know the voice of God. So I'm saying, I'm no, so we'll begin to pray for people and minister to people. And the guy on the back, the church wasn't really big, but the guy on the back, you could smell his whiskey from the back, and I gave him an altar call. He come up and got saved. But his buddy come up and fell out of a tractor trailer, couldn't raise his arm because he busted his, all this been tore up for years. God healed the guy right in service. He walked out of the church doing this to God be the glory. Because see, listen, I've been in this thing too long for any of y'all to huddle him up in the corner and tell me, preacher, we don't believe in miracles. That's your problem. I believe in miracles. I believe in the power of God. I believe God said he'll do what he said he's going to do. Amen. So if you don't want to believe that, that's on you. Go around being miserable with your life. Go around being crippled with your life. Go on out not believing. It. You know, better yet, go and serve your little plastic Jesus. How's that? Amen. But listen to me. But then God told me, he said, tell that grandma that baby's healed. God? I was with the Boyd family that night, and they was playing, and I walked by Sister Ann Boyd up on the mountain. And I said, y'all pray for me what I'm about to say. I fooled around there. And I said, say, tell her that baby's healed. I prayed for somebody else. And I, love, I can't tell you how you hear the voice of God. It ain't like I'm talking to you, but you know it's God. I can't explain it no better than that. But God said, either tell her to sit down or shut up. And I said, Grandma. And the band got quiet because she knew what I was about to say. I said, God told me to tell you that baby's perfectly whole. Now listen, I'm in the Pentecostal church. It don't take a whole lot to get them to shout. And, and, but they had no proof of what I said. And they were just shouting up a storm in that place. I mean, they was. God bless them. You know. And anyway, so that we tore the band out and had to set my stage back up from my, my band the Sunday morning. And, Sunday, and I go to Sunday school, and even though I believe it's outlived its season, that's just me. I like children's worship services, but that's another story. But anyways, I go to Sunday school because that's what they have. I don't want to look like a big shot while I'm here now. Now you can have church. I hate a band just doing that. So I went to Sunday school. I was wore out because I didn't get back to Christian's work like 2.30 that morning. Had to leave 6 to get back where we were always going. When all of a sudden, Sunday school started and a nurse walks in. I knew exactly what she was going to say because I knew what God had told her. She got up and she said, can I interrupt? She said, last night around 1030, and it was around 1030 that night, she said, the doctor come to the hospital and begin to fool with this little baby. And she said, out of the blue, the little baby's eyes opened up. He began to check out of the blue that baby had enough weight on it. And then he couldn't find a hole in the heart. She said, I've worked at the hospital for years. I've never seen him send a baby home in the middle of the night, but he discharged that baby last night. I didn't get to preach. I was in a Pentecostal church. He shouted the house down. I mean, you know, amen. I do love their enthusiasm. Amen. I wish I could get some of you bikers to get a little bit more worship in here. Amen. Amen. Let me go on to the, number four, the fourth one here. Go with me to Matthew 27, verse 29. Matthew 27, 29. Same chapter we just did, brother. 29. All right, they wove a thorn branch into a crown and put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him and mocked and taunted him, hell, king of the Jews. Now, when they placed that thing on his head, it wasn't a very gentle placing. I mean, they, them thorns, they, they pushed down and he was bleeding. And was, um, we went to the skin, I mean, to the little skull, and, and they was trying to push it in. But I want to think about this. I told you, every step of this is for you and I. When they put that on there, guess what reason it did that? Yeah, they may have been mocking him, but Christ knew it was going to happen. And some of you need to get a hold of this right now. Because he took that crown upon his head so you and I might have a sound mind. Are you listening to me? Because I'm going to say something here is going to make some of you freak out. Y'all got my back guys over here. You got your guns ready as y'all shoot somebody and get them up there? Okay. Bad joke. Don't. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I believe with everything that's within me. There's a lot of people going around saying they're crazy. They need delivered. Oh, you listen to me. There's a lot of people need to be delivered, what they've been tickling in and playing in, and it's got their minds warped. Oh, you listen to me. Some of you don't scared to say something here. It might be in some of your own backyards. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you can't play with the devil 
today and come worship him to God tonight. You can't play in his playground and let some of that run in your veins and then think you're going to come up here and lift the name of Jesus. You're going to be miserable with most people. You're going to be up and down and everybody's going to know something's wrong with you. Are you listening to me? I, Jesus Christ, when he took that crown upon his head, he did it so you and I would have a sound mind. But listen to all the but I'm going to take the other part of it. When they placed that crown of thorns upon his head, it was prophesied in Matthew 20, verse 17, so we can wear a crown of glory. Wow. Now, I know a lot of people in church don't believe in all this. I, I've had people tell me, I don't believe for, that, that he's going to give up no crowns for nothing. I said, you ain't reading the same Bible I'm reading. That's a crown of life, crown of glory, soul winner's crown. I can go on. You know, we ain't going to keep them, though, because when we get there, man, we're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. And you're talking about a shout. You're talking about a shout. You're talking about coming unglued. You're talking about forgetting all the past, honey. I'm telling you right now, it's going to get gooder and gooder as we go. Amen. The fifth thing, the fifth way he bled and died. Verse, drop down to verse 31 real quick with me. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. All right, check this out. When they pulled the robe off his back, there again, it opened him up to bleed. But the reason they ripped that robe off so that you and I can wear a robe of righteousness. If you get a hold of this sermon, honey, I'm telling you, it's going to change your life. We are not walking around, and I'm going to be a little offensive with my language, so hang on. We're not walking around like a bunch of bastard children. You better know who your daddy is. You better know who God is. Because God said, I'm coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Now, how do you get rid of them wrinkles? You get rid of your robe and take on his robe. He's handing them out, honey. When you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Hey, it's his Bible, guys. Come on now. Let me hurry up now. The sixth one. Uh, go with me to Mark chapter 15. And verse 24, Mark 15 and 24. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. Now why did they do this? Listen to this. When they put nails in his hands and his feet, check this out, so we can watch what we handle and where we are walking. Now, let me explain this a little bit. It's all, you know, as a Christian, we live in an earthen vessel. We, this is a dust dummy we're walking around in. I know that offends some of you who got education, but you're still walking around in a dust dummy. Amen? And I'm going to tell you something, though. But when the time we get saved by them crucifying him the way they did him, where they knelt through his hands and his feet, in other words, because he is holy, he tells us to be holy. In other words, he has a reminder in his hands what he went through that we have a reminder in his hands of what we handle, what we handle, how we handle it. Because, see, we as Christians, he says, don't tip the Lord your God. You can't go out playing like devil and then get God to rescue you all the time. I see it all the time. Well, caught preachers pray for me. I got caught doing this. You did the crime due to time, Bubba. Amen. Don't ask me to bail you out and pray for you like that. I pray for you to get saved. Amen. Amen. But it also the hands where we walk and how we walk. How are we supposed to be walking as Christians? Now, don't get mad at me. I'm going to say this and I'm going to bust it. I'm tired of seeing Christians. He didn't save us. Not. Why have we been cowards? What are you scared of? I mean, you, got, you, you guys, when you was all sinners, you, you talked to me about how bad you was. What you scared now for? I mean, if they kill me, man, I'm going to be in heaven. I'm going to have a blast. Y'all can divvy up over the heart you want to. I'm going to be walking on the streets of gold and having the time of my life waiting on you to get there. So what are you afraid of? 
The Bible says greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. And the Bible says if we resist the devil, he'll have to flee from you. What are we afraid of? Well, the government says I can't say Jesus. My kids know. You shout Jesus. And if they get on you, I'll come up there and play Pentecostal. Gosh, the sheriff's here. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I'll lay hands on them, what I'm saying. <laughs> Let me tell you something. They ain't going to tell me I can't worship God. They ain't going to tell me I can't pray. There's not a power on this earth that can tell me I can't call upon the name of Jesus. Because why? I'm not sold out to our politicians. I'm sold out to Jesus Christ. I gave him my heart when I got saved, and I'm not going to back down. <laughs> Amen. We need to get to the point as children of God. I'm going to walk his holiness. I'm going to walk in his presence. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be ashamed to say the Holy Ghost is inside me. Amen. Oh, don't go there again, Mike. We like to call it the spirit. Yeah, you better find out what spirit you got in you. Now, some of you I'm about to call out in here. I'm getting tired of it. You can't serve two masters. Either you're going to serve one or hate the other, or vice versa. If you people tell me something in y'all's testimonies, I don't know what you keep looking back for. I'm serious, guys. I got a saved snake. I don't want to go back to that mess. Me and him was talking about it many times in that shop. Man, there's nothing to go back to. What was so good about it? What was so great about it? I stayed drunk, busted, and broke all the time. I mean, not knowing nothing. When I got saved, for the first time in my life, I felt good about me. And for the first time in my life, I had direction in my life. For the first time in my life, I had peace in my life. For the first time in my life, I wasn't afraid to die. For the first time in my life, I knew how to love people. For the first time in my life, I knew how to forgive people. For the first time in my life, I knew I was destined to go somebody somewhere with Jesus Christ. It was preordained for the word begin that Jesus Christ was coming. They knew it. Jesus. There's no other name more powerful than the name of Jesus. So how should we walk? I want to walk like Jesus. I want to talk like Jesus. I want to forgive like Jesus. I want to love like Jesus. The only part I've got going is the long hair. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Let me hurry up here. That was the sixth way. The seventh way. John chapter 19 and verse 34. That's pretty good preaching for not so slim. Biker, ain't it? Amen. Amen. John chapter 19, verse 34. And one of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. Hmm. Y'all might as well get ready to shout on here. When they pierced his side, you may not understand this, but I'm going to preach it for a little bit. This opened a cliff in the rock. <laughs> it opened a cliff in the rock. See, the blood is for our atonement. The water is for our purification. And I'm going to preach here in just a second here. But the blood both flowed. And let me tell you something. Listen to this. They both flowed from him. So let this silence of the, let the silence of the Christians that's so fearful begin to understand that we are justified and sanctified through the blood and the water of Jesus Christ. So you listen to me. In other words, in other words, when you admit it, 
There's nothing else that you need to admit. Because when you call upon Jesus Christ, he forgives your sins. He don't forgive some of them. He don't forgive you a little bit and you got to earn the rest of it. When you get to the altar of God and say, hey God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I need to be forgiven. Man, he washes them sins away. He takes them away and puts them in a sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered no more. He writes your name in a Lamb's book of life. He seals you with the power of the Holy Ghost and you become his property. Let me tell you something. See, the devil's falsely accusing us. You got pardon me a little bit. I got to preach here just for a moment. We got food over there. It's, it's funky looking, but we're going to eat it. We got meatloaf looks like a hand. Meatloaf looks like a skull and everything else. That's all right. This fat boy's going to eat if y'all don't want it. Well, let me tell you something. See, God don't remember who I was. He don't know. He ain't got a clue who I was. I mean, right now, see, the devil's not in hell like some people think. He's up in heaven. He's in the throne room falsely accusing you and I. And I can see right now looking over there, man, he's saying, you know, God, that old drunk, God, I don't know who you talk about. God, you know that coke addict? I don't know who you talk about. You know that whoremonger? God said, I don't know who you, you know that one that done this and that? God said, I don't know who you're talking about. The devil says, that boy preaching that trash ministry, God said something. Yeah, I know who he is. I don't know who he was, but I know he's mine and I own him. That's you. You've got to put yourself there. You've got to let him write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is you. You are somebody in Christ. We're not second-class citizens. We're somebody's. We're royalty. That Queen of England better bow to the church. I do like them fuzzy hats them guys wear, oh. <laughs> That'd be radical going down the road. <laughs> Sheriff, you sure you want me loose in your county? <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to close with this. See, trash ministry, God's bringing us somewhere. We offer Jesus one-on-one now. We enter the meat of the word. And when you begin to eat the meat of the word, you get spiritual muscles. You get spiritual cockiness. You begin to get some strut in your walk. You begin to get some power in your walk. You begin to get a look that the devil's afraid to look at you. When you walk in the midst of the enemy, he's afraid. Let me tell you something about my Marine Corps past. I love one of the stories they used to say. They was fighting the Japanese and this unit got all cut off. There was no way getting the supplies in. The boys couldn't get out. My old boy looked at it, all of his Marines. He said, boys, we got them where we want them. These young Marines looked at him. Are you nuts? We're cut off. We can't get no supplies. My boy said to him, he said, we got them exactly where we want them. We, any direction we shoot, we can kill them. <laughs> What's it got to do with being a child of God? Everything. It may seem like you're cut off from the flow sometimes. It may seem like you're cut off from the anointing at times. It may seem you're cut off from the word at times. It may feel like you're cut off from the church. But I'm telling you, when the devil gets you in that position, stand up, shake yourself, proclaim you to cut out of God who you are, and fire away in the name of Jesus Christ. He can't stand it. He's not going to stand in your face, sis. You square your shoulders, tell the devil you go to hell. I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. I ain't taking it no more. We as Christians, we're the most powerful force upon this earth. We're more powerful than the tsunamis. We're more powerful than the nuclear bomb. We're more powerful than all the armies together because we're the... Hmm, Let me tell you something. We're the bride of Christ. Now, boy, you listen to me there. Before you guys got married, before you guys got married, let me go back here. This is a bunch too. I had something to do with this wedding back here. 
You still ain't mad at me, are you? Love you. I love you too, buddy. But see, before the wedding, I mean, I mean, before the wedding, he'd have kicked someone. I can say behind this in my room, he'd kick somebody's rear end if they'd mess with you. After the wedding, he'll definitely kick someone's rear end. Are you getting my picture? Some, that's too blunt, preacher. Well, get over yourself. I'm tired of being religiously correct. Just get down where the rubber meets the road and be real. When you get, you become a Christian, you're the bride of Christ. He ain't going to let us get kicked around. He ain't going to let us get stomped on. He ain't going to let the enemy slap us silly. He, what, what the devil does to you is what you allow the devil to do to you. Now, I'm going to get ready to shout here real quick. I don't mean to embarrass my pastor. But we're so honored to have Pastor Martin here. Amen. Him and his folks, his family, his church. Make him feel welcome. Don't pat him, okay? I'm going to rejoice. I'm rejoicing with you, brother. The devil was going to try to stop my brother. He tried to put a halt on this man's life, him and his family, his ministry. But see, when... When the devil thinks he's got something, and when it meant to do harm to you, God's already out in front turning around to do good. God. Man, Bobby and Pam left out of here. Bobby stood right back there underneath them pictures. Well, he's bigger than pictures. And he's back there agging me on that Friday night. Come on, preach it, Mike. Don't give up. <laughs> Man, I can't preach no harder than this. They went home to be with Jesus. But we met our brother. And what a precious family and ministry they are. I, I loved him as soon as I seen him. I loved him. He said, I said, that's my, that's my family there. That's my fellow minister of the gospel. That's, that's, I mean, Paul and, Paul and Silas and, and, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of us, boy, we, we're family. And the devil thought he's going to stir up something. People got to praying. Let me tell you some of this. Some of y'all know this. But we crawled up in that ambulance because my brother's in trouble. And Pastor Dan Whitlock was up in there. We was praying. They said, Brother Mike, there was a light went over top of that place, shining all over that ambulance. And then one of the workers looked at the ground. He said, I like to know what they know. I like to meet that Savior. They know the boy standing on the side of the road got saved. As Paul Harvey says, rest of the story. My brother went to court this week. The judge and the state trooper ain't never seen nothing what's been going on. Because the judge seen forgiveness. The world in this community is seeing the genuine love of Jesus Christ in the blood-bought children of God Almighty. The devil meant to stop you, but God told me to tell you there's a double portion on your life tonight. Run with it, brother. Come on, give God some praise in this house. Now I'm, going to, now I'm going to hurt his feelings. You take me on, you take me on for life. I got pastors, you might want to talk to them about that. You better believe it, all of us. There's one blood. There's one blood. There's one blood. Well, let me tell you what's getting ready to happen. God done showed me this, brother, and I believe he's dealing with you. God's going to use us to heal this neighborhood because they're going to watch us come together. What Reverend King started, you and I are going to see a lot of it finished. Yeah. <clears throat> Honey, if the church don't come together, we're done. If the church don't come together, there's not a white church, a black church, an Indian church, an Oriental church, or a Mexican church. That's the church. Yeah. 